warm welcome to today's reproducibility seminar. Especially also warm welcome to our guest listeners. Um, today we're honored to have Marcus Munafo with us. Um, Marcus Munafo is Professor of Biological Psychology and MRC Investigator at the University of Bristol, where he is also Associate Pro Vice Chancellor for Research Culture. He co-founded the UK Reproducibility Network in 2019 and is currently Chair of the Supervisory Board. He has a long-standing interest in the factors that impact research quality. In today's talk, Marcus will delve into strategies for enhancing the quality of academic research and learn from oh, and what we can learn from other sectors. So thanks a lot, Marcus, um, that you're here and we're really curious to hear more about your topic. Thank you very much. Well, thank you for the invitation. It's um, always a, a pleasure to be invited to speak to uh, different groups. I actually um, have a bit of a relationship with Switzerland in that my parents met at the WHO in Geneva and uh, I spent a lot of my childhood at that other end of Switzerland, I guess. Um, let me share my slides and I'll begin. So this is, to some extent, an autobiographical talk to begin with, that then moves on to what is happening at the moment to address some of the issues that I'll talk about, um, and then concludes with uh, where we might go in the future and how we can better work collaboratively to address these issues. I have a long-standing interest in research quality, and in the factors that influence that. Um, I'm a psychologist by training, but I've worked across a range of different biomedical disciplines and learned a lot from working across those dis different disciplines. And I think beyond the biomedical sciences more generally, every discipline does something well, understands something well, every discipline can improve how it works in some ways. And I think working collaboratively, learning from each other, sharing examples of good practice is the way that we need to work to be able to do that. Um, and that extends beyond even academia to other sectors, other industries that, again, do some things very well that we can potentially learn from, but also could be informed by how we do things within academia. So that's going to be a central part of this talk. Um, but where does it begin? I'll start with oops, um, some brief disclosures. You've heard about my different roles. I'm chair of the UK Reproducibility Network Supervisory Board, and I also have a role in the Medical Research Council here in the UK. None of this is directly relevant to this talk, except that uh, philanthropic donation mentioned at the end from John Climax. And I'll be talking about the project that he has funded uh, about halfway through the talk. So one of the things that we are taught is that science is self-correcting. And of course, in principle, that's true. The scientific method has um, norms and processes built into it that will, if conducted and conducted appropriately lead to self-correction if we find ourselves going down the wrong path on our journey of discovery. The problem I would argue is that many of those things that we need to do in order for science to self-correct don't, don't happen, aren't incentivized, aren't rewarded. So for example, we need to run experiments, run studies again, to see if we can get the same results. In other words, if our results are reproducible, uh, we need to publish the results of studies that didn't work as we expected them to and do so honestly and transparently so that people can understand what has worked and what hasn't rather than come up with the same idea themselves and try the same thing further down the line and similarly find that that doesn't work, which is inefficient. And we need to admit that we're wrong. We need to learn the skill of recognizing that the idea, the discovery that we perhaps built a career on has not panned out because many of the things that we do will not pan out. That's just in the nature of science. So when you think of it in those terms, how many of those things are we actually incentivized to do? To what extent are we, uh, for example, incentivized to run replication studies? To what extent are we incentivized to publish null results? To what extent are we incentivized to um, admit when we were wrong? And the things that act against this self-correction function within the scientific method I think are the cognitive biases and the natural human predispositions that we bring to our work, the fact that um, we find it difficult to admit when we're wrong generally, let alone in the context of work that we have built our career on the back of. And we're working within the incentive structures that mean that what is good for our careers is not necessarily well aligned with what is good for science. So that compound effect of human fallibility and cognitive biases and the incentive structures that we're working within mean that 
<clears throat> I don't think we can simply assume that science is self-correcting. That self-correction is an active process, not something that is simply an emergent property of science happening. So I'm going to illustrate that in the context of a case study that is one that is relevant to me because this was an area that I was working in as a postdoctoral researcher 20 years ago. Uh, this was in the era when um, looking at the role of specific genetic polymorphisms on complex behavioral traits required the identification of specific genetic variants that we would then genotype in the laboratory and interrogate statistically. It was laborious, time-consuming, expensive. My own research at the time was on the pharmacogenetics of smoking cessation, so genetic predictors of response to smoking cessation treatments. And I was more generally interested in behavioral genetics and psychiatric genetics, which was emerging as a field at the time because the technology to allow that direct genotyping of specific genetic variants was still in its relative infancy. In 1996, there was a paper published which suggested that an association between a genetic variant in the serotonin transporter gene influenced the uh, degree of self-reported neuroticism in a sample of healthy individuals. And this was one of the first demonstrations of an association between biological genetic variation and behavioral variation. And that was an exciting and um, transformative finding. It was published in Science. And on the back of that, there was this rapid growth in studies, both attempting to replicate that finding. So that was a positive. This was a field where actually there were many replication attempts and um, a good number of publications of null results. But it went beyond that initial association to interrogate the potential mechanism. So associations were found between this genetic variant and the response of the human amygdala to threat-related stimuli. The amygdala is the part of the brain that responds to threat, and this genetic variant seemed to be operating through that um, neurobiological pathway. And there were also studies looking at how this genetic variant might explain individual differences in the response to stressful life events and those kinds of risk factors that we know influence the subsequent onset of depression. So this was a really elegant mechanistic story with potential clinical application that would allow us to identify high-risk groups and perhaps divert uh, resources to those most at risk and therefore most likely to benefit from those resources in the context of preventing depression. It was really exciting. This was in the textbooks um, by the early 2000s and a vast amount of time, energy, resources went into exploring and unpacking this web of causal pathways. There was only one problem with it, which is this. It was all wrong. Every single paper in that literature turned out to be wrong. And the reason for that is simply that that foundational association, the starting point for all of this, that association between a genetic variant and anxiety-related traits was a false positive. The original sample size was in 500 people. This has been, I would say, irrefutably confirmed by large-scale genome-wide association studies in now millions of participants, which have shown no evidence of a signal in this particular region when it comes to anxiety-related per, uh, personality traits, depression, a constellation of different phenotypes that are relevant to this. And these are not my words that all of this is lies. The reason it's in quotation marks is that that quote comes from this review from a few years ago by Scott Alexander on um, the serotonin transporter gene. And the way that he describes it in part of this blog is thus. This isn't just an explorer coming back from the Orient and claiming there are unicorns there. It's the explorer describing the life cycle of unicorns, what unicorns eat, all the different subspecies of unicorn, which cuts of unicorn meat are the tastiest, and a blow-by-blow -blow account of a wrestling match between unicorns and Bigfoot. In other words, this rich, detailed, complex story of the interplay between biological and environmental influences and the mechanistic pathways through which they operate to influence important downstream clinical phenotypes was all a house of cards because that foundational association was a false positive. And once you remove that from the bottom of the house of cards, the whole thing comes falling down. And Scott Alexander is a psychiatrist. He's not an academic researcher, but he was angry in this blog post about the amount of wasted effort and the fact that no one called out this literature early enough to prevent this proliferation 
of false positives. So how did that happen? How did we allow that to happen? The key thing, and the disclosure here is that I'm an author on some of these papers, was that actually very early on in the life cycle of this literature, there was a self-correction event. So in 2005, less than 10 years after the publication of that first paper, we reported in a sample size, not of 500 people, but of 100,000 people, no evidence of association between that genetic variant and anxiety-related traits. This was an exact replication, but in a sample size that was two orders of magnitude larger than the original one. And we also showed that for some of those other downstream literatures, such as the gene environment interplay literature, the pattern of results was consistent with chance findings. When you look at how small those studies were relative to um, credible effect sizes that were beginning to emerge in the behavioral genetics literature that genetic effect sizes or effect sizes associated with common genetic variants are typically very small. So most credible behavior geneticists by 2005 knew that this was a false positive. This, there's no accusation here that anyone did anything wrong other than perhaps a bit of publication bias, writing up their um, positive results, not writing up their null results. But this was not fraudulent activity by any means. Chance findings will happen when we use statistical methods to declare discovery. What's important here is why didn't the field self-correct? Why didn't the field in 2005 stop and think, okay, this looked really interesting, but it turns out not to be worth pursuing any further. Again, go back to that point I made, what is good for your career versus what is good for science? So did the field self-correct within 10 years of that initial finding? If you search on PubMed for the number of publications reporting on this particular genetic variant, you can see that the peak of 195 articles a year happened well after that publication in 2005 that was the self-correction event. In fact, the mass of publications in this area happened well after we knew irrefutably that that original finding was a false positive. People continued to publish on this, albeit down the long tail of journals becoming ever more specialized and ever further removed from the kind of scrutiny that more critical behavior geneticists would apply to this particular kind of study. People continue to publish in this area because we're rewarded for publishing as academics. We're not rewarded for being right. We're rewarded for the number of articles that we publish, where we publish them, how many citations they garner. <coughs> and so for that reason, people will continue to, continue to be incentivized to work on this topic and to publish because you could still get work published. So does this look like science self-correcting? I mean, ultimately, yes, because now almost 30 years after that original publication, we're starting to see publications in this field tail off. But how much wasted time, effort, reviewer time, editor time, journal page budget? We have an article that we are writing up at the moment that looks at the environmental impact of all of this work being conducted in laboratories using minus 80 freezers that have the same carbon footprint as a house. To what extent could we have spared that by simply admitting much earlier on that this field was a blind alley. So I mentioned earlier these compound effects of human fallibility and cognitive biases and incentive structures. I'll touch on those in a bit more detail now. This is a nice book by Nicholas Taleb. He's not an academic researcher. He's written on the role of chance in life in the markets. He's more famous for his second book, Black Swan, but I think this book is, is better, Fooled by Randomness. And one of the quotes in there is that scientists may be in the business of laughing at their predecessors, but owing to an array of human mental dispositions, few realize that someone will laugh at them in the disappointingly near future. This is the point that we are not good at admitting that we're wrong. We don't bring enough humility to our work, partly because academic research is all about your name. Your name is your brand. Your name is on your paper. Your name is on your grant. And so we conflate in, unconsciously, I think, our personal sense of self-worth and the value we place in our work, which makes it all the harder because when someone critiques an article by Bonafo et al, it feels very personal in a way that isn't helpful, I think. And we also know that we work within incentive structures that aren't well aligned with what's good for science. So this is a nice quote from a review that's quite old now, certain features of the working environment of science 
may have unexpected and potentially detrimental effect on the ethical dimensions of scientists' work. And again, this is not to imply that this is conscious or malicious. Humans respond to incentives. If there are any economists in the room, they will know that. And obviously, financial incentives are an important part of that. And, uh, and of course, there are indirect financial incentives. Your career trajectory, if you have a publication in Nature or Science, for example, is very different to your career trajectory if you don't. And the, your earnings in terms of the area under the curve will be correspondingly different. So there are financial incentives operating that shape our behavior. And the problem is that we also work within a research culture that is actually very ancient. Our model of scholarly communication in journal articles is 400 years old. Um, I have to be careful what I say now, but the um, first academic journal article still in print is uh, Proceedings of the Royal Society, which is um, has been going for 400 years. The actual first scholarly journal was a French journal that was published before then, but they're no longer in print. So I have to be very careful how I say that, because when I say this to a French audience, I generally get pointed to the French Wikipedia page that is slightly different to the English Wikipedia page on that subject. Um, but because we have that ancient culture that typically drew academics from a particular stratum of society, the independent scholar who was independently wealthy, who pursued knowledge for its own benefit, we implicitly rely on trust, trust in individuals to do the right thing, to report their results transparently and honestly, to report all of their results. I'm not sure that was ever true. I think there has always been ego and competition in science. But if you look at how we work, you can see echoes of that implication that the type of people who do research are the type of person who can be trusted. So this study you may be familiar with, it was conducted by some psychologists just over 10 years ago, where they collected real data. And they showed that if you build enough flexibility into the design, conduct and analysis of your study, you can arrive at a finding that is clearly false. So in this case, that if you listen to when I'm 64 by the Beatles, you become younger, not you feel subjectively younger, but you turn back the arrow of time and you lose a year of life, which would be great if it was true. Uh, but of course it isn't, it's a clearly false result. Structurally, this is identical to any number of behavioral science experiments you see published every day. That I think is the less important finding of this paper. The more important point they make is this one here, that you having done that, have the option to present everything that you did, laying bare all of that flexibility in the design analysis conduct of your study, or you can present a redacted curated version that is more focused on convincing the reader of what you found than of telling them everything that you did. And they showed this here. So the full abstract lays bare all of that flexibility. And when you get to that final p-value of 0.04, you know in the back of your mind, well, there were lots of researcher degrees of freedom here. They rolled the dice multiple times. We have to take that into account when interpreting that p-value. But if all they reported was the text shown in bold, you would have a very different impression. And this is structurally identical to, like I say, dozens of articles published every day. The question is, when you're reading an abstract, how do you know which version you're reading? How do you know whether you're reading a full, honest, transparent and complete account of everything that was done versus the account that the authors want you to read to convince you, to convince the reviewers to get it published in a certain kind of journal? Which way did the current incentive structures in science push authors? And is that the way that we would want them to be pushed in the context of what is good, what is best? For science. So that reliance on trust means that we don't have a system that is inherently trustworthy because it lacks transparency. So research culture, which is part of my job now, is an important part of why we have, I think, this problem with research rigor and, um, and in particular self-correction. The norms, the values, the behaviors, the expectations of our community, we can capture this here in terms of the different facets of research integrity, the professional behaviours, good and bad, leadership, misconduct, and so on, managing risks, ethics and governance, but then the research process itself. And I would say that um, what we need to bring to all of these is as much transparency as is possible and appropriate, and I'll come back to why in a moment. But like I said earlier, if you look at where we have come from as a sector, our ways of working 
are still rooted in this Victorian 19th century ideal of the independent scholar drawn from a certain stratum of society that was a certain type of person and therefore could be trusted. And I think we still as academics like to see ourselves in that way. And by and large, by the general public, I think we are seen as trustworthy because we're not motivated by financial concerns, for example, but we are still human and humans have unconscious biases that psychologists in particular understand that shape our behavior. We respond to incentives. There is no one who is the platonic ideal of the scientist who is completely objective, impartial, disinterested, and so on. And this is the journal that I mentioned, the philosophical transactions. Many of our ways of working are still ultimately rooted in, in this case, this 17th century model of scholarly communication. The fact that our primary model of scholarly communication is still constrained by the assumption that paper is expensive, that we communicate knowledge on dead trees, I think speaks to the antiquated nature of many of our ways of working. So yes, now many journals are online or online only, but actually a PDF is just an electronic version of a print article. It's still a 3000 word essay that is static and unchanging that we lay down in the archeological record of knowledge that doesn't well reflect the dynamic evolving and constantly updating nature of knowledge and the complexity of team science in the 21st century. So what can we do and what can we learn from other sectors? A few years ago, we published an article on statistical power suggesting that um, most studies were underpowered. That was uh, led by Kate Button, who's now a PhD student, uh, a senior lecturer at the University of Bath. She was a PhD student at the time. And on the back of that, a funder, the CHDI Foundation that funds Huntington's research, convened a working group to discuss what could be done. And the chief executive of that funder made the analogy that scientific research now is much like the US automobile industry in the 1970s. In the 1970s, cars would roll off the production line at Detroit. There was a high level of production, but the only quality control that happened was at the end of the process when someone would count the number of wheels and check the engine started, and that was pretty much it for quality control. The statistician, W. Edwards Deming, took the concept of quality control throughout the manufacturing process to the Japanese automobile industry. The idea being that you run spot checks throughout the process, and if your error rate goes above a particular threshold, you stop the process, identify the error, correct it, and then restart the process. He took that to the Japanese automobile industry, which transformed the reliability of its cars, and it still has a reputation for reliability today. That model, which became known as the Toyota process, is now adopted not just by all automobile manufacturers, but by all manufacturers. This idea of embedding random quality control checks into the process of manufacturing. And Demings's less intuitive insight was that, that by doing that, not only do you improve quality, you also improve productivity because you're not having to recall fully built cars once you found out that they're badly built because US cars in the 1970s had a terrible reputation for reliability. Instead, you're focusing on the process. And if you get the process right, you can trust the end products to be high quality. So the analogy here is that we should move our spotlight away from the end of the process, the peer review of the journal article, and onto the process itself. And, there, and through that trust that the end product will be high quality because the process is high quality. And I mentioned that this became known as the Toyota model. These were the principles of the Toyota model. They're not a bad starting point for a, for example, research culture strategy, but the central part of it for the purposes of this talk, the right process will produce the right results. And if you think about how we work, again, going back to our 19th century culture, we are, as academics, quite artisanal in how we work, because that was the the culture that existed in the 19th century, that PhD students were effectively the apprentice of the senior academic. But now, again, team science, a science that works at the interface of industry and so on, and much more complex science with much more technological innovation as part of that process, we need to be working in ways that are more modern and more professional and more interoperable. So what did we learn from that case study at the beginning on the serotonin transporter gene. And that's just one example of what was known as a candidate gene study, where you had to identify a particular candidate to genotype manually and then interrogate. And that one example was the most 
profound, perhaps, but there are plenty of other examples of uh, genetic associations that prove to be false positives. In fact, the vast majority of candidate gene studies were false positives. But around the time that it was becoming apparent that those candidate gene studies were producing false positives, a new technology was emerging, the genotyping chip that allowed for, at the time, the simultaneous genotyping of half a million genetic variants so that you could, in a hypothesis-free way, interrogate the entire genome for signals in the context of your phenotype of interest. Now, half a million genetic tests, uh, genetic SNPs means half a million statistical tests. So you have to correct for that. And at the same time, it was becoming apparent that effect sizes for common genetic variants were small. You put those two things together, you need very large sample sizes to be able to uh, detect anything because the p-value threshold for discovery in these studies is 10 to the minus eight. And that requires collaboration to achieve those large sample sizes because no single study had sufficient participants to reach the threshold of tens or even hundreds of thousands of participants. And what that meant, that collaborative framework that was necessitated by the technology and the awareness of the small effect sizes was different approaches to authorship and genome-wide association studies have a very large number of authors because of their collaborative nature and therefore the role of different individuals within that needs to be captured in some way beyond simply authorship order but also more importantly if you're going to be bringing together data from multiple studies you need to have a framework for data and code sharing you need to harmonize approaches to um, data wrangling to data analysis to quality control checks and so that embedded within this discipline, a culture of transparency and quality control. And the robustness of findings from that literature is light years away from the robustness of studies in the candidate gene literature. This was one of the first, if not the first study that was published. Um, and you can see that this was around the time that people were realizing that the serotonin transporter gene was um, was a false finding. This was in, in 2007. So again, very early on in that life cycle of that literature that I showed you earlier, this was why genetic epidemiologists move away from candidate gene studies because they realized that these whole genome approaches produced absolutely robust findings. And this first association between the FTO gene and body mass index is an absolutely robust finding. And because you now know where you're looking, you can look at this genetic variant in a much smaller sample size with an uncorrected alpha, and you will find it because this is absolutely a real association. So the quality of the findings that were generated by one approach versus another in basically the same um, domain of genetic epidemiology was completely different. And part of that was because of this approach that was necessitated by the technology and the awareness of small sample sizes, collaborative with an emphasis on transparency and quality control. So I think that is a compelling reason to adopt open research practices more generally because they can serve as a mechanism for quality control. That scrutiny that is made possible through data sharing, code sharing, the pre-registration of study protocols, the posting of preprints, all allows for errors to be detected and also creates an incentive internally within research groups to check that there are no errors in a data deposit before it's published. So in our research group at Bristol, we've been publishing data on our institutional repository for about 10 years now. And a few weeks, no, a few months ago, we were contacted by a master's student from the University of Glasgow, who as part of her course had been asked to download a data set and run the code against it um, just as a pedagogic exercise. And she emailed us and said, I'm really sorry, but when I run your code against your data, I get a different table to the one that's in the published manuscript. And we thought, oh, and we looked and she was right. There was an error in our deposit. And fortunately, it was a minor error. It was a typo in the data dictionary. One of the variables had become flipped. When you correct that typo and run the code on the data, you get the right results. And so the manuscript, the published article was correct. The data was correct. The code was correct. It was just the data dictionary that was in error. But that was an error that was spotted, and it was spotted seven years after we published that deposit, that data set. But the fact that it is available for scrutiny means that those errors get detected and means that we can correct them and we can update our deposit with a new data dictionary. So it does happen. People spot these errors and we can do something about them. And if you think about it, 
most of us will have read journal articles that um, have been read by multiple authors, read by multiple reviewers and editors, been through a copy editing and a proofreading process, and they still have typographical errors in them because humans are fallible. We miss things. There are typos in data, there are typos in code, there are typos in manuscripts. So we need to embed checks in the process to catch as many of those as possible and also have a system that allows for checking to continue after the process has ended. And I think open research practices can allow us to do that. Here's an example of what happens when you mandate transparency. So these are studies funded by the National Heart, Lung and Blood Institute, a funder in the US. They're all clinical trials that test an intervention against a comparator. Year of publication is on the x-axis. In 2000, which is indicated by that little flag, the funder required primary outcomes to be registered on clinicaltrials.gov. Before 2000, nearly all of the trials were positive and showed a benefit for the intervention over the comparator. That's shown as a little plus. And some of them were neutral with no evidence of a difference between the intervention and the comparator. Those are shown in blue. After 2000, when there was transparency, that would mean that if someone switched their primary outcome in the final write-up, someone could go back and check that against what they pre-registered and show that that was in fact not what their primary outcome was originally intended to be. You can see that most of the studies were neutral, a couple were positive, and one for the first time showed harm. All that was being mandated here was transparency, but the incentive that that created was not to promote a secondary outcome and pretend that it was your primary outcome just because the effect size was larger and the p-value was smaller. It incentivized more honest reporting. And as a result, what you see on the right, I think is much closer to our own personal experience of what science is like, which is that most stuff doesn't work. And this was my experience as a PhD student. The first study I ran as a PhD student attempted to replicate what looked in the literature like a really robust finding. I didn't replicate it. I thought that the problem was me, that I wasn't cut out for a career in science. And it was only because I was fortunate enough to meet a senior academic who said, oh, no one can replicate that finding, it's rubbish. But of course, no one had reported their null results. So if you naively read the literature, you wouldn't know that. So most of us have the experience on the right, but the published literature looks like the version on the left. And that's not healthy. So what are we doing about that? At the University of Bristol, we've got a project, this is the one funded by John Climax, that uh, attempts to bring in the quality assurance framework used in, uh, in industry, in the pharmaceutical industry, to ensure the integrity of the data that are generated by the data generation process. And this includes foundational training in data integrity skills, a framework for ensuring data integrity and quality assurance, and embedding that quality assurance framework within the life sciences in Bristol. Now, we are not trying to do things exactly like industry, but we are trying to work in a way that learns the lessons of industry. There are plenty of examples of the pharmaceutical industry um, overselling their results. But actually, if you look across the whole pipeline from discovery through to phase three trials in industry research, it's an interesting example of evolving incentive structures. Once they have invested billions of dollars in a new compound that they have had licensed. They're incentivized to make that money back, which is where you get the problematic behaviors. But at the drug discovery stage of the pipeline, they are much more incentivized to get the right answer, to make a correct go or no go decision on a novel compound. Because if they make a correct go decision, they make their company a lot of money. And if they make a correct no go decision, they save their company a lot of money. And they're not interested in publication or anything like that. So the incentives are very different at that end of the pipeline. And that's where we're trying to learn from. So the project has these different elements. Some of it is about infrastructure and policies. How do you manage research data? Where do you store those data whilst the project is live? Where do you archive and deposit those data once the study is complete? Research culture, what are the incentives that we can build into, for example, our promotion criteria? We now include open research practices in our promotion criteria. And we're looking to include those in our hiring criteria as well, because this data integrity framework is um, grounded in open research practices. And how can we come up with a reproducibility by design framework that embeds quality control in the entire research process in a way that is, again, interoperable across research groups so that you don't have research groups working in fundamentally different ways that mean that 
you can't share knowledge or skills across those research groups as effectively. And the principles are that the data should conform to the highest possible standards of data integrity. In other words, you should be able to come back at the end of a project and look at how the data were generated and confor uh, confirm the quality of the process that led to those data that you're now interrogating, applying those open research, open science uh, principles from the outset, and applying quality risk management proportionately. In other words, in your entire research process, what are the one or two things where getting it wrong would have the most profound effect on the quality of your results? Is it the quality of your randomization procedure, for example? Or is it the quality of the reagents that you're using, depending on the nature of your research question? So where are the really critical points of entry to make sure you're getting those things right in a way that is proportionate? So here are some examples of what we do throughout the research process. And you can see that it begins at the design stage with an open science plan, for example, with identification of critical data and processes and the application of risk management to those, creating transparent records. So for example, open lab notebooks, and there are many electronic versions of those now available. Um, predefining our analysis plan, ensuring the quality of the um, analytical code that we're using, appropriate statistical rigor, pre-publication checks. There was a pilot done at a different university in the UK where articles were submitted for a check by a statistician before they were submitted to a journal and 70% had an error in them. Now, most of those were minor errors, a second decimal place on a p-value or something like that, because again, typos will creep into any human activity. But the fact that the rate of errors was that high in a selected subsample of papers that um, authors opted in to have checked in this way, I think should make us sit up and pay attention to the fact that maybe the quality of our processes is not where it might be. So we can unpack this further. I'm not going to spend too much time on the details of the project, but if anyone is interested, please do let me know because we are running um, a collaborative approach to this to share as much of what we're doing as possible. But you can see that particularly at the design stage, there is a lot in there on open research, having an open um, science plan, but also embedding good, um, good practice into the design of the study through bias minimization, minimization and rigor, statistical input at the design stage, experimental design input, and so on. There are many dimensions to it, but all of these together provide that um, quality assurance framework that, uh, that I've been talking about. And we are developing aspects of this in other phases of the research life cycle. So continuing to monitor the data quality as it comes in, ongoing risk assessment, data management checks, for example, um, at the analysis stage, the coding quality, the statistical rigor. And then at publication, in particular, we are looking at these pre-publication checks as a way of catching any errors that have remained despite that process before we submit to a journal um, when those results then become embedded in the version of record. And then finally, remembering that even after a study is complete and the article has been published, there is a need to retain the data, the code for ongoing um, use in, other, in a variety of different contexts, whether that be quality control through the scrutiny that is afforded by that transparency, reuse of data and code by other research groups. And we're also looking at ways in which these um, other research outputs, the data and the code, for example, can be used in other contexts. For example, we're working with secondary schools in Bristol to see whether or not um, teachers can use some of our data deposits in classroom demonstrations to bring to life some of the aspects of the research that we do amongst 17 and 18 year olds studying for, um, uh, for various qualifications in psychology or biology or whatever it might be. So just to finish off, a few years ago, we published this um, manifesto for reproducible science. We identified various threats to the hypothetical deductive model of scientific uh, discovery that is shown there. And we also identified the stakeholders that had the potential to change some of those incentive structures or introduce initiatives to um, address some of these threats. So, for example, we talked about cognitive biases at the top, um, but we also talked about open research as one area where researchers themselves have a great deal of agency and can simply elect to work in a more transparent way that therefore affords 
greater scrutiny. But to bring together those different stakeholders, not just researchers themselves, but institutions, funders, publishers, learning societies, and so on, we um, we started to bring together the um, enthusiasm that existed on the ground to bring about change. And I think a key part of how we do this is to recognize that however much we aspire to be objective, impartial, disinterested scientists, we need to recognize that we're human and that we work within a culture that uh, has not necessarily evolved to keep pace with the different incentives that uh, exist around us now. So this is another quote from Deming that I think is helpful here. A bad system beats a good person every time. I think another area that we can learn from is safety critical industries like aviation and surgery, where those industries focus very much on embedding a just culture, which is one whereby when errors occur, we don't think who made the mistake and how can we punish them? We think, how did the system, the process allow that mistake to happen? And how can we improve the system or the process to prevent it from happening again in the future? Clearly, people who repeatedly make mistakes, who are sloppy or negligent or whatever it might be, that's a different situation. But the majority of error is honest error. And that arises when the system or the process or the culture isn't um, optimized to address or prevent those errors. And aviation is a very good example of that, where um, airline safety now is... Um, is extremely high exactly because at every level people are incentivized to call out an error when they see it rather than do the easy thing and pretend they didn't see it so for example someone who sees that a, a nut is loose on the wheel of an airplane before it's about to take off will cancel the flight rather than risk it getting into trouble later on and so in our research group to try and bring this to life and to make it easier to talk about our failures as well as our successes. We have a Slack channel called Triumph and Disaster where people talk about their successes, the papers that got published, the grants that got funded, but also their failures to normalize the fact that failure, if you want to call it that, is an integral part of academic life. Going back to that figure I showed from the National Heart, Lung and Blood Institute that actually most of us, our studies don't work as we expected them to. If we can all talk about that more transparently and, and show our denominator when it comes to the things that go wrong as well as the things that go well, I think that can make people feel much safer, much able, much more able to talk about um, what they learned from their experience and share that in a way that I think can create a very supportive environment and much more of a just culture. So bringing together researchers themselves, institutions, funders, publishers, learning societies, is what we do through the UK Reproducibility Network. It's intended principally to focus on research quality through transparency, through open research, but there is a strong element of changing research culture and learning from other sectors, whether it be industry, whether it be aviation and other safety critical industries. And what's exciting is that we now have, as you hopefully know, reproducibility networks in a, um, in a range of countries, um, principally across Europe. And next week, I'm traveling to Ukraine for the launch of their reproducibility network. And uh, the hope is that this will continue to grow. And we have a regional network in Africa where the, the individual countries don't have the critical mass to support a, uh, a single reproducibility network, but regionally they do. So I started out with a story that I think was quite pessimistic in terms of how we did things badly um, as a community, as a field. But I think a lot has changed in between. I think there was much more openness to working transparently, but also to learning from other sectors and to improving and to working collaboratively at a local level, at a national level, and increasingly at a global level. And I will stop there. Thank you.